and go and <laughs> these little things. I, I know, I know. Them. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> um, so uh, if you'll just be talking directly to me, to me like over the cameras. Um, and uh, anytime I ask you a question, if you can kind of incorporate the question into oh, okay. your response, because I'm not going to be a part of this. Oh, okay. It's entirely you. Um, so uh, just to open up, just tell me how, you, how you're feeling right now in your recovery mode. Oh, yes, I'm getting better. Like 75%. Yeah. Yeah, probably. That's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what else do you have going on this weekend? Oh, we're going to the coast, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's oh. why it was perfect for me that we moved earlier. Oh, good. Because then we'll take off this afternoon. Oh, good. Was that your brother? Uh, yeah, actually. Oh. he's. We're donating a bunch of stuff to the O&E rummage sale. So he's he was over at my house, like, trying to find, okay, are these things, this box, those things? Oh. So oh. <laughs> directing <laughs> like, him around. Deal with yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be back. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. So you're going to head up to the coast after yeah. this? Yeah. Okay. Well, late, a little later this oh. afternoon. Yeah, that's it's perfect. Be pretty nice. Yeah. Pretty nice yeah. Summer. Kenji and Dana and Zena will be there. Okay. And then later tomorrow, Raf and his girlfriend are coming. Oh. So it's great. Family. Yeah. Cool. Good. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, we'll kick off. Um, I'm going to ask you to uh, tell me your name and what your role is. With Portland Tyco. Okay. And when you started, obviously you're still part of the group, but tell me your name, what your role is, and when you started with Portland Tyco. <laughs> so my name is Valerie Otani. I don't think I'll do the so part. <laughs> That's good. My name is Valerie Otani, and I'm one of the founding members of Portland Tyco. I'm currently still a performing member and a member of the board. Um, can you describe to me the first time you saw Tycho and what your response was to it? I first saw Tycho in San Francisco at the Cherry Blossom Festival Parade. And I just remember this flatbed truck with people on top of it playing Tycho. And it was so dynamic. And women were really powerful and active and energetic. and. Um, so that was the image I always had in my mind. Nice. Um, being that you are a founding member of Portland Tyco, um, there's going to be some questions unique to you. Um, can you explain how uh, Portland Tyco came to inception? Portland Tyco actually got started. The seed for it was a couple of years before the actual founding. There was a conference of artists of color, although I think at that time they were called multicultural artists, but there, a bunch of us were sitting around at a table and talking about how it would be really great to have a Tycho group in Portland. Um, I was interested mostly for my sons, my kids, the idea that there might be a way to uh, participate in Japanese culture that wasn't quiet and well-behaved, like origami and calligraphy, flower arranging, some, you know, that was something more dynamic and uh, loud, powerful. Uh, so, and, and we shared around the table uh, a, a real desire to bring that kind of a presence to Portland. So the group of us met informally. Um, just gathered people who might be interested. We had no one had any experience with Tycho. Um, we actually met uh, the first time at now Supreme Court Justice Lynn Nakamoto's home and brainstormed ideas. She was doing woodworking as a hobby and so offered to help building drums. Uh, Chisao Hata knew Russell and Jeannie from Shasta Tycho and connected us to them as a resource. And around the same time, I was helping to organize Kudabu, which was the summer program for the Japanese uh, immersion program at Richmond School. We wanted to find a way to continue the kids' uh, learning of Japanese during the summer, but in a totally non-academic setting, something that had to do with 
playing, playing in Japanese, learning completely different things, interacting in an informal way with Japanese counselors and teachers. So we put Kurabu together and uh, through Shisao's contact with Russell and Jeannie, we brought Russell and Jeannie up to do taiko workshops at Kurabu. Uh, Shisao was also studying with Sahomi Tachibana and Sahomi taught the children's dance class. Um, so when Russell and Jeannie came to do taiko with the kids, we had them do an adult workshop with those of us who were interested. Um, they came back again the next year, did another workshop, did a performance. And so we were, and they had then all along had sent us um, a few pages, like mimeograph pages or photocopied pages of how to build a drum. And we used those little notes as a way to, to uh, think about how we were gonna try and build a drum. Fortunately for us, uh, I think that second year, Anne and Zach moved to Portland with the idea that they wanted to start a, a taiko group. I think they were looking at where to relocate after uh, graduating from Stanford and Portland looked like a good location to them and didn't have a taiko group. So they arrived right about the time that Russell and Jeannie were doing their final performance with the kids. Anne and Zach came visited, saw that, and then continued to meet with our little community group. And they and Zach had the full experience of having built Stanford Tyco, of having worked really closely with PJ and Roy at San Jose Tyco about really the foundations of creating a Tyco group organizationally, practically, financially. And so they came with that knowledge to our group, which had a strong community base and um, no knowledge, no knowledge of Tyco, of how to build drums. And that was just a very fortunate coming together. And so that became the, the very beginning of, of Portland Tyco. That's the most thorough history uh -huh. in my you know, 15 plus years of the group, so that's really interesting. And in many ways, folks were... Very early on. Yeah, yeah. This process. Yes, very interesting. I'm going to take a quick uh, stop here. It's a little premature, but... Um, Make sure that it uh, doesn't yeah, run out. Because we're at that close. <clears throat> so next I wanted to talk a little bit about the community support from the very beginning. Oh, so. okay. Please continue with the community, community aspect of the development of Portland Tyco. From the beginning, Portland Tyco was really fortunate to have strong support within the community, the Japanese American community. It was really interesting because 
none of us were from Portland. We weren't native of Portland. I'm from California. June was from Denver. Anne and Zach were from California. And yet, and, and Portland's Japanese community was really very close, tight. Everybody knew each other. And yet, uh, the, the, the really strong, some really strong leaders of the community immediately embraced the idea of forming a taiko group. George Azumano, just one of the most, you know, revered leaders in the community, told us that he'd always wanted to see a taiko group in Portland. And um, so he was an early financial supporter, uh, came to performances. Uh, John Murakami, who had been a contractor and a, a um, shop teacher at high school, jumped right in and said, oh, well, you need tools, you know? You need tools to build your drums and stands. And he went to the Japanese Ancestral Society and asked them for money to buy us a saw. We, we weren't even thinking about it, but he, he just, oh, this is what you need. And then he would invited us to his home to work in his workshop and help figure out all the ways that we were going to use a router and all the refinements of how we were going to build these drums with his woodworking skills. And then his wife, Sumi, would fix us lunch. I mean, it was such a lovely embrace from the community. Yoji Matsushima of the Onsen Corporation knew that there was a drum that they'd been storing for decades in his company warehouse. It had been given by a Japanese trade association to the Japanese Ancestral Society in Portland. But no, you know, I think it had been used for Obon and various community celebrations, but it, you know, it's worn out. I think maybe the head needed to be repaired and it was just sitting in the warehouse and Yoji offered it to us and June Schumann spearheaded repairing uh, and refinishing the drum uh, that we still we call that we still play with this that we call the onsen that is a traditional Japanese drum made from the whole trunk of a tree unlike our barrel stave type drums American style drums but that support from the Japanese community was really a uh, a key motivation for us to continue to build the group. We felt um, that we were doing something that was really appreciated. People said to us, well, we didn't think anybody was interested in this sort of thing. They were amazed that we could sell out a concert and that there would be all these people there, that they had paid money to come and uh, participate or see Japanese culture expressed through taiko. And I think that that was, that was a certain contribution that we were making back to the community for them to realize, oh, there's interest in this beyond ourselves. Oh, very nice. Mm -hmm. um, that actually uh, leads into some other questions involving the community. Um, with where we are now, 25 years later, how, how is Portland Tyco still relevant specifically to Portland or to Oregon? Hmm. And that's factoring in the fact that there are other Tyco groups now within the community. How is Portland Tyco's voice relevant in this specific community today? <laughs> One of the things that I've been pleased about with Portland Tyco is there a certain kind of commitment from the beginning to share 
the knowledge and experience that we've gained uh, with the broader community. So um, now there are four, five, maybe six Tycho groups of various kinds around the community. Uh, and almost all of those leaders have been part of Portland Tycho uh, as, at one point. And I think that that's, that's a good thing, that, that people could come, spend some time with us, clarify their own personal vision about what they wanted to do with Tycho, and then they could take off from that and create their own very specific voice. For us, that means much more variety within each of the groups is very different in what they do. And um, although, of course, it's great to be like the one and only, I think there's a lot to be said for having been able to help grow the Taiko community in a larger sense. That spirit of generosity was really fundamental too in Portland Tycho's whole tradition of collaborating with other, other artists. Early on, um, we found that we would be performing at a multicultural festival or something like that, and there would be these really talented, interesting other performers that would be performing uh, alongside at the same, at the same event. And so that's when the idea came up for Art Explosion, for us to take the experience that we had in being able to successfully produce a concert, you know, arrange publicity, uh, sell tickets, do the graphics for a poster, um, you know, negotiate with the venue and um, technicians that you need to be able to put on a show and create a showcase for these other performers who had a smaller audience, but who we felt were really, um, really talented, really brought a wonderful perspective that needed to be shared. So um, that was the beginning of Art Explosion, which we did a couple of years. And through those collaborations, like with Shivivanka, those are connections that have lasted forever. You know, those are, are long standing, um, really, relationships of collaboration. Dime Roberts, Chisau Hata, um, you know, a, a Persian oud player. We ha it was a great experience for us to be to be learning more about other artists in the community and to, to help share uh, their talents out to the broader audience. That's very nice. You actually developed a couple of uh, questions into that. Okay. That was great. Um, just a minute here. I think that's a good place to be. It's perfect. <laughs> So many things to keep track of. <laughs> Freddie, my cocktail is very quiet right now. And I just heard him squawk. Oh, I but didn't hear him at all. Part, I migrated him downstairs. Usually his home is where yeah. I do. <laughs> we had a little sit down this morning. I said, all right, dude, you're going to have to keep quiet. <laughs> OK. Okay, great. For said performance, um, can you think of a a performance that was particularly memorable for you 
describe it mm -hmm. and why it was memorable? For me, the most memorable performance was performing for the Asian Club at Oregon State Prison. This is an example to me of where Tycho, being part of Portland Tycho, gave us individual members a chance to have an experience that we would never have had otherwise and to really grow from, from that as well. So um, the Asian Club at uh, Oregon State Prison had decided that they were going to save all their money to be able to have a special family event where their families were invited to have a meal with them and that we would be there to perform. So, of course, just going in the prison itself is a, a wild experience. All the no metal, no shirts with logos, no denim, because you might be, um, yeah, I don't know, confused for an for a, a, a in, inmate. Um, all the security, the, the locking doors and clanging uh, gates and x-rays or the drums to make sure we weren't bringing any contraband inside or taking anybody out when we left. But um, the actual uh, event with the prisoners was just so memorable to sit and chat with, with them and their families. The meal itself for them was very special. I mean, they'd had to save a lot of their earnings to be able to have a special meal for their families. And um, we, when we played, I just felt just this amazing sense of how, what a privilege it was to be there, but also that we were expressing um, freedom. And um, how you can really express feelings, strong feelings, in a positive way. You know, through that, the passion, the power of hitting the drums. And um, that that wasn't a freedom that they had. And, or, and, and somehow it, it just was so very special to be able to um, try and show our sense of pride in our culture, in our personal um, kind of direct connection to power and expression, and to be able to do that, to share that with them. It just was um, something I'll never forget. When we went back the second time, uh, it was a totally different experience because instead of playing for just the club, we played for the whole, whole prison population in the big yard. I mean, that's something that you hear about in movies, you know, the, the big prison yard. They, um, we got very specific instructions. We had to wear orange vests over the top of our costumes so that it was clear we were not inmates. And we were instructed that if any um, altercation broke out or if there was sound of gunfire or anything like that, we were supposed to hit the ground and there was a specific person who was going to lead us from the stage out over to a specific doorway. That was very intense. <laughs> and. Um, and at the time, we used to really have a rule that we played with. When we performed, we didn't wear any jewelry, no watches, no glasses, things that were distracting. I thought to myself, uh, I'm going to wear my glasses. I mean, if I'm going to have to <laughs> escape, crawl, crawl out, uh, you know, through this prison yard, through a special uh, doorway, I think I need my glasses. But um, that you know, it was a totally different experience of just being in this huge yard with all of these 
guys that were incredibly muscularly built and covered with tattoos and not wearing shirts and having them kind of hoot and holler at at some of our members it it was that too was just an experience that us those of us living our little mundane lives really don't don't get to experience to know what that whole other sector of of the population is experiencing um, in prison so that's that's really much a part of Portland Tyco as well is that as much as we are hoping to contribute to the cultural life of the community through um, through our original compositions and the collaborations that we do there's also tremendous growth for us personally as members to go from being very shy and quiet to having to to be performers to have these experiences of traveling to very quiet small rural communities and showing showing them an art form they've never had any idea of before um, the chance to work with with other groups that have similar commitments to social justice and to help support their work so there's great there's great growth for us as members as well thank you that's a very very eloquent response and having only been a part of you were there the at the second one, one weren't you yeah. oh my gosh in the um, archiving of the videos i found footage of the first one and so oh really I wow didn't realize how different the setting was. yeah it's yeah more intimate right inside so, yeah but i'm glad that you spoke on that because i'll be able to um, yeah, the second one, I mean, I just remember and they were catcalling to Utah. It was Utah. so no, I, bad. It was Utah. Oh my God. Um, in this camera, I need to switch the memory card because it doesn't hold as much as the other one. Does. Yeah, that's another thing to think about. Uh. I have to do this how many times? <laughs> I remember that. No, I'll be able to um, get a card that matches that one for the next round of interviews. So this one's 16 gigs, that one's 32. When I was interviewing Teresa, um, one camera ran out. I just, it, these, these cameras don't tell you how much memory is left on them. Oh. It's a little mm -hmm. bit primitive in that respect, but they have such really good video quality, hmm. shallow depth of field, you just can't get around it, you gotta do it. So that other camera made a noise, is that? Yeah, it just turned off because, oh, okay. because I had it in idle mode. Just a little bit of echo in it. You really have encapsulated examples of this question I'm going to ask you, but I'll go ahead and <coughs> ask it anyway because you, in case you have anything else to add. Um, so I'll state the mission statement um, and then ask my question. Through innovation and excellence in Tyco, Portland Tyco affirms Asian American pride, inspires audiences, 
builds community, and educates about our heritage and culture. With that in mind, can you give at least one example of how Portland Tyco upholds this mission statement? I think one of the hallmarks of Portland Tyco has been um, using, doing original compositions, oftentimes around topics that are closely related to Japanese American history, or in some cases we've collaborated with other communities to try and pull out issues, common common interests that, that we want to try and express through, uh, through Tycho. And uh, that, we have a number of fairly uh, complex pieces that have been developed to try and really encapsulate the, the internment experience or the history of the Japanese community um, through, through the music, dance, and... Oh, I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. Just... <coughs> um, oh, I should have just had to keep... No, that's fine. I think I'll, I'm happy to start that one over. Let me see what I have here. Has anybody talked about training in Japan, too? I forgot to no. mention that whole part. No, that's good. That's okay. Yeah. Based on the mission statement, mm -hmm. uh, what's an example or a couple of examples of how Portland, Portland Tycho upholds the mission statement? We really try to use Tycho as a way to tell the stories of the Japanese American experience. So I think for us, in a piece called, like A Place Called Home, we try and create a musical and emotional journey that takes people through uh, an evocation of immigration, settling in America, working on the railroads, creating community and then having that community burst apart by World War II and the internment experience, the community coming back together again and growing and questioning where we are as a community today. And I think that that um, quality of really trying to tackle stories of our history or issues that we're interested in, but trying to tell them in, in a musical, um, visual, artistic way is one of, one of the challenges that, that we love to take on and that we, f we hope is a, an effective way of bringing those stories to the community. Yeah. Um, Japan, can you describe the experience of traveling to Japan to take workshops and to 
bring back some yeah. education exactly. uh, for inspiration in the form of Taiko group. When I think about ways in which Portland Taiko has opened up the world to all of us as members, of course, our study trips to Japan come to mind. We've gone as a group to uh, Japan twice, and in each case, we were taking lessons with some of the masters of, of Taiko in Japan. We were studying in completely, uh, we, in completely Japanese setting. We practiced before we left on how to, to behave in a way that was going to be respectful, attentive, acceptable to much more traditional Japanese uh, teachers. And we had um, just the experience of being able to learn from such a variety of people to travel on our second trip to, uh, to Michelle and Toru's home base in, at Wadabiza and study dance and sort of live within an artistic community for a few days. Um, these are experiences that are not the kind of uh, uh, normal it, it, a tourist trip to Japan. We were really able to be uh, immersed, learn so much, meet wonderful people. Another uh, aspect of that learning too is the trips that we've taken to pilgrimages uh, to internment camps. So very early on, we made a uh, we participated in the pilgrimage to Thule Lake, which was a, just such a unique camp because it was the, uh, the camp where troublemakers were sent. And so many of the people who spent time there were often ashamed to say that that was the camp where their family had spent time. And the stories there were very powerful. We went having composed, we were in the process of composing a work, uh, a taiko piece. We shared that in process. We got people to contribute ideas, thoughts, reactions, and then continued to refine that piece to bring back, to, to perform. Going to Minidoka as well was really a, uh, an important trip for the group since most of most people in Portland area and Seattle went to Minidoka. So this, it really was seeing where most of the rest of our community had spent time. So these are um, such invaluable ways of, of learning opportunities that we've had as part of Portland Tyco. Thank you. Um, I just have one more question for you. Okay. <laughs> In one word, how would you describe Portland Tycho? Community. For us, it's both being part of a larger community, of course, the Japanese American community, and in, in Oregon, really being able to speak and express aspects of that culture, the artistic community in Portland and in Oregon to, to really be able to participate as um, an arts group in that larger community. But there's an inward facing side of it that's been very important to us as well. And that's the community of our group, of really creating an atmosphere where we feel safe enough to take risks of doing things we've never done before, learning, looking, looking stupid and awkward and trying to uh, become better players, to participate creatively in uh, just the, I think almost everyone in the group will talk about the community, the family of the group itself. So. I think that community is so key, both within our organization and the broader community. Perfect answer. Absolutely. 
Thank you very much. I oh, appreciate great. your time. We, sure. We've touched on all of the topics I hoped to. <coughs> You're such a good speaker that you encapsulated two or three. Oh, good. <laughs> uh. Each thing leading organically into the mix. So let me just take one more approval through here. Yep, we're good. Um, for some reason, that camera stopped getting. This one's been tried and true. It's my base camera, so that's good. Um, I will ask you, though, if um, there are any other parting thoughts that you wanted to share that maybe I didn't cover. Hmm. Give me an opportunity. <laughs> I know. That's kind of a big one now. If you don't, that's okay. No, I don't think I, you know. I mean, I think there are ways about kind of the excitement of the next, of having, you know, made it to 25 years, do you know what I mean? And, um, and still to be strong as an organization. That's a very fortunate position to be in. Um, so I, it's, it's hard. Things, people go, lots of groups fall apart at a certain point, and we're lucky to have rebuilt ourselves, but I don't think I want to go into that exactly. <laughs> <laughs>